This is a short clip from my parent membership group on Subscribestar. That's where I post my most practical and comprehensive videos. Once a month, I address common questions in the form of a topic video, and I also run live monthly Q&As where parents can submit a question and briefly talk through their situation with me. Please check out my Subscribestar to learn more about the different subscription levels. Now here's the video. This topic video, again, was sparked by a question <clears throat> submitted by a parent. And this is about the types of desistance that I've been seeing, the types of needs that a kid might be meeting through their trans identity or a young adult, and then whether or not that should inform the way you make parenting decisions, the way you think about your relationship dynamics with your kid. And we're going to cover a lot of things, including parents who dogmatically refuse to affirm, parents who dogmatically affirm, and then kind of having a flexible approach that is really individualized. So there's a lot to cover today, so I'm going to dive right in by reading the question that a parent sent. So she said, uh, Sasha, I wanted to explore something that came up in this Q&A. You mentioned that in your experience, the sisters tend to fall into two camps. Those for whom a gender identity is an unhealthy coping mechanism and has a tendency to recur in times of distress, kind of like an eating disorder. And then those who firmly reject their prior gender identity, and therefore perhaps these are folks who might be filing lawsuits for maltreatment. At the same time, I've also heard you say that we as parents shouldn't expect our kids to come forward to us at one point and clearly indicate that they're done with gender ideology or that they reject their prior trans identification and that such clear behavior is the exception rather than the rule. So this is really a question about like, are there kids who actively reject their experience and then rethink it and then others that just kind of move through it without giving it a lot of thought? And this sparked, of course, a, a lot of ideas in my mind about things that I've seen. So before I dive into my response here, as always, I would just encourage you to remember, you know your child's situation best. I am speaking from anecdote and not from any kind of hard scientific evidence because all of this is new and nobody has answers for any of these questions. We can just kind of talk about what we've experienced, what we've seen, things we've heard, stories we've heard. But remember, your situation is, of course, unique like everybody's, and you have to think about what makes most sense for you and your family. So take what you want from this video and leave the parts that don't make sense. I'm going to start by talking um, about what you'll hear in this video. Um, I'm going to use a lot of analogies, and I just want to be really clear. When I use an analogy about something minor, like a kid experimenting with goth hairstyles or, you know, some kind of death metal music. I don't mean to imply that the stakes are the same. What I'm talking about is the fact that adolescents, sometimes unaware of what the stakes are, dabble in various identities and move through them with kind of like the same level of seriousness or severity they might with music or with a certain band obsession or whatever. So, I just want to kind of ground this conversation in the fact that even though the stakes are incredibly high, sometimes it's the parents who are able to restrain their terror and parent in a kind of normal way around this issue that are able to help their kids move through it. Of course, again, that's not always the case. Sometimes parents contact me and say, we thought this was just a phase and we kind of didn't take it that seriously. And here we are three years later and we're really concerned about medicalization. So again, there's no hard and fast rules. But I have seen lots of cases where kids kind of flip flop their identity in a way that's so casual, they, they don't understand what the stakes are necessarily. So anyway, we're gonna start by talking about what are the kind of common desistance responses that I've seen. And if anybody has additional thoughts about this, because we see a lot of desisters and detransitioners sharing their stories and talking on Twitter and social media, feel free to kind of add some in the comments. But I've seen some kids have a kind of neutral emotional impact. This is the type of kid that the author was alluding to in her question. Kids who move through it, they move on, but they don't really go back and deeply examine why they felt that way 
or they don't become critical of gender ideology itself. So these are kids who just kind of went through a period where they were confused about themselves and they realized this identity doesn't fit them. So sometimes these kids will just simply move on to a new fixation. Um, they might be equally prone to, to identifying with labels, but maybe they're different ones. So maybe these are kids who are now obsessed with having ADHD or OCD or autism or some other diagnosis, or they might still identify somewhere in the LGBTQ uh, cohort, but maybe they're really proud now of being gay or of being, um, you know, gender queer, or gender fluid, or some other kind of version of an identity. They might also get really interested in other hobbies like a favorite band or even their hobby as a taekwondo practitioner or a musician or something like that. So sometimes they've just simply shifted to some other thing, but it hasn't become like this deep existential question of like, how could I have gone through that, right? They don't feel particularly harmed by the identity. It's like not that big of a deal to them. And in those cases, if there was a lot of conflict within the family, there may still be some residual uh, hurt feelings about parents not having been affirming or whatever. So these are not necessarily kids who say, you know what, mom was right about all of it. I'm so glad she didn't affirm me. These are kids who might say, you know what, I mean, it's true that I was going through something, but it was really hurtful that my parents didn't believe me or trust me or something along those lines. Um, and these are kids who might have really been working out either a body discomfort issue or some identity thing with peers. It could be a lot of different reasons and, of course, multiple reasons that might have driven them to the identity. So in a way, these kids are in a good place because they aren't having some sort of existential crisis about what they've been through. On the other hand, I think they can be somewhat vulnerable to going back into the identity, for example, if they find themselves in a really difficult place in the future, or if their body issues return, or whatever originally brought them in there. So it's, it's just a bit of a, an interesting situation, because I think a lot of kids go through that, and they may have a little bit of embarrassment or just like not want to talk about it. If you found this video helpful, you'll want to join my parent membership group, where you'll find a lot more depth and detail, along with practical parenting advice. The link is in the video description below. Thanks for watching.